go away. <laughs> Hey, you can use my phone chair. You can use my phone chair. Yeah, hey, I'm on my phone. Hey, sorry, we're at um. Hey. Good, how are you? Did you get an invite from Tina Shea Blanchett? Let me resend it. What's your what's your personal? A S Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me send that. We might also wanna Okay, I just sent it again. It could have also gone it might have also just gone to um, spam for work. Yeah. Our products are so hard. <laughs> okay, you should you should see me in a second. I'm on Tina Shay's. Okay. Yeah. I see you guys. <laughs> okay. Wow. You know how to um dim the lights in here so that we can get use the sensor guide when we start looking better on here then. Oh actually dim the lights? Yeah, yeah, try, yeah we try to turn them up on my wall. You wanna get everything quiet? No, Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Last impromptu IT support. I'm just kidding. I'm never getting Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Hey, Jen. Okay. Hey. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Sorry. I think the uh, my assistant went home a little while ago and I was uh, lost. That's okay. We had some technical issues because we're ex basically external, so we have to do everything yeah. not on the corp network. Yeah, when you, when, you, when you said external, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm, right. I'll be crushed. That's right. <laughs> can you see and hear me okay? We can see and hear you great. So we have all of our students here. Um, right. They're on a big jumbo TV. Um, I'll pass you around so you can see the school. Okay. Everyone's like eating. Their, their highlight of the CLP is getting free dinners. <laughs> That's how I, I understand. That. I understand that. Um, so, guys, everyone, we have Alan here from Google. He's a partnership director, um, and he saw the update about orientation and all the great work that you guys are doing, and really wanted to get involved. And so, I asked if he would come and talk about entrepreneurship, um, his work at Google, and also the company that he started and. It got bought by Google, so that's kind of cool. Um, and so, and just talking more broadly about professional development, um, career development, and then you guys can ask questions. Sound good? Take Great. it away. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, hey everybody, thanks for having me. I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Can you hear the echo? No. All right, I'm going to switch. Hold, hold one second. I'm going to just go off my earpiece. Hold one second. Okay. How about now? 
You're it's good. still echoing a bit. Um, how about now? Yeah, we can hear you. Let me try muting us for a second and see if that helps. OK. All right. Yeah, the echo goes away when you mute. So tell you what, Jen, you just keep it muted, and then when questions come in, uh, or anybody wants to stop, we can just sort of, you know, uh, we, we can take it off mute, and then we can go back and forth. OK? All right. Um, or take it back off mute just one more time, see if I can, uh, maybe the echo went away. How about now? Take it off the mute. We can hear you fine. Well, let me see if the echo is still there. Now the echo is still there. Now let's put it back on mute. Okay. All right. All right. So let me uh, let me jump in and uh, sorry for the technical difficulties here leading off, but it's uh, it's nice to uh, to um, have a chance to talk to everybody. Um, so my name is Alan Masrick. Uh, I joined Google uh, a little less than a year and a half ago through the acquisition of my company, Quick Office. Um, and Quick Office was a company that I started in 2002 um, that ultimately developed a, um, a Microsoft Office compatible suite for mobile. That kind of sounds like a mouthful. So in school, I imagine you, many or most of you use Microsoft Office, Word, PowerPoint and Excel for a variety of different uh, projects uh, and assignments. Microsoft Office, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel only have traditionally existed on Microsoft Windows computers uh, as well as there's a Mac version. And then Microsoft did extend uh, Office to Windows Phone uh, the, the phone version of the Windows operating system. Um, but it did not exist on mobile platforms. And so we invented a, a compatible suite that um, enabled somebody who had begun work on a Word document or a PowerPoint or an Excel to be able to uh, read that Office file so the format, Microsoft Word does word processing. Microsoft Excel does spreadsheets. Microsoft PowerPoint does slideshows. Um, but there are a, those are a unique format that is proprietary to Microsoft. And when you're dealing with different operating systems, so we think of Android as an operating system or Apple's iOS operating system, there are different operating systems. And the Microsoft suite was never written for those operating systems. So, hey, Alan, it's, it's yep. Jen. Can you see us? Yep. OK, we're going to, for some reason, our, we're not seeing you. So give us a second. I'm going to dial us back into this Hangout. OK. If that works. Because we, we can hear you, but we can't see you. So one second. OK. okay. Okay, we're back. Okay, good. Okay, good. Now and we can see you, and I'm. I think the echo is gone as well. So take off the mute. Oh, great. Okay. I think it's gone. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, that's back. No. Okay, I'm gonna mute us. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so everybody can continue to still see me. So thumbs up. Okay, good. <laughs> see Jen's thumb come into the picture. So, uh, uh, so again, so when Microsoft you know, developed Word, PowerPoint, and Excel to do word processing and slideshows and uh, spreadsheeting. They did not extend those software applications to other operating systems. So many years ago, I started this in 2002, before there was Android, before there was iOS, when there were other operating systems, Palm, Blackberry, Symbian, um, 
we developed this Microsoft Office compatible suite for those other platforms so that when somebody was on their, um, back then, smartphone, and then later also tablets, they could work with their Office files, um, Office Microsoft Office format files, and we obviously use them at school all the time. And the most typical way that you're going to use those is you're going to get them through an email attachment you know, as you're sending versions of things back and forth. Um, but with our software, you now have the ability to work with your files while you were mobile. And like many startups, and you know, you all have interest in the startup area. Um, there's quite a bit of change. There's a tremendous amount of change that goes on, uh, particularly in the early years of a startup, because, I mean, literally nothing ever goes in a straight line. Because the reason there's an opportunity for a startup is because there is a market that you're going after which is currently underserved and, uh, or not even developed. And as the market develops, it changes like crazy. And so the expression that entrepreneurs refer to is pivoting. So our business pivoted quite a bit in the early years. Uh, and actually, we really settled on this mobile office or mobile productivity play in 2005. And 2005 was, a, was very early. The smartphone world was um, pretty early back then. Um, and so, like a lot of entrepreneurs, you got to really, you know, the way I always sort of uh, uh, express it is you just kind of put your chin into the wind and soldier on because it can be some lonely days and some really tough days where you're burning a lot of capital and you've got to fund externally. You got to get money from, uh, you know, friends and family or what they call angel investors or venture capitalists because you're just not bringing in enough, enough sales revenue. Uh, to keep the lights on, um, but you're you know you keep at it, and you know executing well and smartly towards a goal, and then throwing a good bit of luck, uh, and you can uh, end up with a successful outcome. In our situation, as the smartphone world began to grow faster and faster, and larger and more capable smart smartphone devices that we preloaded. We actually entered into contracts with the manufacturers. So with Samsung, with Motorola, with HTC. And we would preload our software so it would actually ship with our software. We ended up, by the time we sold, sold to Google in June of last year, we had shipped QuickOffice, a branded version of QuickOffice. It went out under our brand uh, to over 500 million devices uh, across, uh, effectively, all the major manufacturers except Apple, interestingly. Um, and, but as people got more and more accustomed to doing more and more work while mobile, and the devices became more and more capable, and there were many more of them, we grew and grew very quickly. And then along came the iPad. And the iPad, we all think, has been around forever. It was released in April of 2010. It's kind of staggering to think of that now, because it feels like it's been here forever. Um, but now that you have this bigger canvas to work on, uh, the amount of work that people started doing on tablets, you know, that required our software, because yet again, Microsoft didn't have Office on iPad. Uh, we just took off like a rocket ship. And um, in 2011, uh, this is one quick stat, in 2011, um, in 82% of the days of the year, so you know, well in excess of 300 days of the year, or around 300 days of the year, uh, QuickOffice was within the top 10 highest grossing applications in all of iOS across all categories, you know, games, music, finance, productivity, business, everything. And um, we just we began, and that's sort of the luck portion. No one could have foreseen the tablet phenomenon. We did foresee the smartphone growth, but we did not foresee the tablet phenomenon, which just put us on turbo boost. Um, now, our relationships with, what's interesting, I think, if you think about us, is 
everybody knows these massively successful, you know, venture capital backed companies, you know, Facebook or Twitter, uh, that are worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. And we didn't sell to Google for billions and billions of dollars, but we had a very, very, very excellent uh, sale to them. But it, I think it's interesting to think about a company that is, you know, we at the end were about on a run rate of about fifty million dollars in sales, about three hundred and forty employees. So we were a mid-sized company; had grown very, very quickly. Um, but and we were sort of a household name in certain uh, areas to people who you know actively used, product, you know, their smartphones and tablets for productivity. Um, but you know, we were not uh, you know not some of the household names like a, certainly like a Facebook or a Twitter. Um, but we began to develop a relationship with Google because they licensed our software. Um, and um, then they licensed our software again for a different purpose a year later. So the first time in 2010, the second time in 2011, which then ultimately culminated in uh, their acquisition of us uh, in June of 2012. So, I want to stop there for a minute, and I want to open up for questions because I want to talk about what life is like inside Google, and um, uh, and as some of you are interested in internships and you know interviewing at Google, but you know I want to make sure I'm on the right track. So let's take it off mute. Let me feel that there are if there are any questions that people would like to address, would like me to address. Okay. Yeah, you guys want to come up? Are you going to ask one, Jeff? Well, I'm just kind of curious what happened between 2010 and 2012. Like what happened? Did, did, did you can you hear that question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. If you're saying what what happened to the company between 2010 and 12? Yeah, like how did you get to the point of being? Uh, Say that one. How did you get to the point to where you got acquired? Like what what was the growth like in between those okay. years? Uh, you know, I, I spend a, a lot of time with entrepreneurs, and, and one thing that I tell them all the time is that um, almost always co companies get acquired by friends. Uh, friends, I sort of say with quotation marks around it. What I mean by that is if a large company like a Google buys a smaller company like Quick Office, it's because they're very familiar with you. It's very rare that you know, some investment banker picks up the phone and calls the head of the acquisitions department of a big company and says, "I've got this great, you know, small company you should buy. You know, take a look at the materials and come buy them." That does not happen very often. And so, the relationship we developed a very broad and deep relationship with Google around some really important software. So. Uh, if some of you, I'm sure many of you use Google Docs, and Google Docs is they have to. What? They have. Google Docs is, you know, now people think of it as Google's version of Microsoft Office, and they've got, you know, Docs and slides and sheets, which is word processing, uh, you know, um, uh, presentations and spreadsheeting, uh, and it's really built around a collaboration framework. So that uh, you know, two people or ten people can co-author a document at the same time. So what they call real-time collaboration. Um, now, the first license deal. So Google came to us and licensed our software. So they didn't buy us; they licensed our software in 2010 to help them with the conversion of an Office file in the Microsoft Office format into the Google Docs format because if you had originally authored that word, word, process, that word document in Word, that word processed document in Word, and now you wanted to collaborate with others in Google Docs, you had to convert a Word file into the doc format. So that's a good bit of what our technology does. It understands how to read the Microsoft Office file format and then display it properly. And so they licensed our conversion technology initially in 2010. And that touches a whole bunch of areas within uh, Google. Uh, then along the way, we, um, and earlier, excuse me, earlier, 
in the very first Android phone that came out, it came out at the end of 08, um, and it was called the G1, and it was built by HTC. And uh, we preloaded on that device, so it gave us a lot of exposure to the Android group. Then in 2000, that was the end of 2008, early 2009. Then in 2010, this commercial deal with our conversion technology. Then in 2011, they licensed more code for us because uh, Quick Office was building uh, our uh, building a new version of our Office suite, suite to work in Chrome, both the Chrome. Uh, browser, which I'm sure many of you use, and the Chrome operating system, which fuel powers Chromebooks. And so, yet again, Quick Office has all sorts of relationships and activities going on inside Google. And by the time of this, in effect, third deal, if you think about it, uh, that triggered the acquisitions department inside Google called corp de corporate development. Uh, to reach out to us, uh, and that happened in the fall of 2011. I think the first meeting was early October of 2011, and uh, we entered into a term sheet, or excuse me, a letter, what they call a letter of intent, by February of 2012, so it's a pretty lengthy process. Then uh, another sort of what they call a definitive term sheet at the end of March, and then we uh, you know, officially sold the company the 1st of June. So again, in order for companies to reach, small companies to reach sort of to a level of visibility that generally culminates in an acquisition, there is almost always uh, relationships that have been developed uh, over the preceding years. Thank you. Yeah, so you talk obviously about pivoting when you were sort of in the early stages of your company. Um, right. and it sounds like you were starting your company, you know, pre Steve Blank's books and pre Eric Ries doing a lead startup. So could you talk a little bit about your methodology at that point in, in the development of your company and sort of what influenced your pivots? You know, were you taking customer feedback, user feedback? Um, could you just sort of talk a little bit about your methodology? Yeah. It is, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm asked this often, and it's sort of interesting because I would like to be able to come to you and say I had a grand vision in 2002 that I then tweaked along the way. It's really not true. In 2002, I saw a financial arbitrage uh, because there was an opportunity to spin a product line out of Palm, you know, the makers of the PDAs, uh, and they were dominant at the time in the making of PDAs, but to spin a product line out of Palm because one of my best friends had been Chief Operating Officer of Palm. And so we actually co-founded the then named company, Mobile Digital Media, uh, in 2002. And then we later changed the name to Quick Office. The pivot, the, the original business, we didn't own any of our own IP. We published third-party content burned it on memory cards or CD-ROMs and sold it at retail, physical retail, like Staples and Best Buy and stores like that, uh, right alongside the Palm PDAs. And it was really just a, um, this was a content business inside Palm that had been there to, um, uh, you know, what retailers refer to it as sweeten the checkout. Somebody buys a $200 PDA and they want to sell them a $30 case or a $10 stylus plus maybe $30 of content. And the content, you know, which is software burned on memory cards, you stick in the back of the Palm PDA. This is before wireless was very prevalent. And so that was the original business. Well, I found out pretty quickly, I didn't really like being a retailer. And I, when I, the, the arbitrage was, is I cut a really unique deal with Palm where basically they gave me this, they gave me money and the business. It was just, it was a nutty deal. And I had access to their distribution footprint worldwide. So, I thought I was just going to flip the thing in a year uh, and, uh, and and make some money and move on. Uh, and then we really decided to build a business around it. Um, and I decided pretty quickly I didn't want to be a publisher. I wanted to own my own intellectual property. Uh, and I didn't like physical retail. It was very tough to make a good margin at physical retail. You know, when you when you that shelf space at Staples, as an example, for the supplier, that shelf space is really expensive. Uh, you actually have to pay them. 
uh, what are called market development funds. And so it's a tough business. And so, um, you know, we clearly saw the electronic download side of the world. That was coming in a big hurry. Um, and I wanted to own my own IP. I did not want to be a publisher of somebody else's content. When, you know, others' content we, we published were things like the Merriam-Webster Dictionary or the Britannica Encyclopedia. We took those things and, and then packaged them and burned them on memory cards. So in 2004, I, the, the, the key pivot is I bought uh, a little tiny six-person company in Dallas uh, that owned the Quick Office IP. And uh, we then, I sold off the publishing unit to sort of fund what I was doing on the now newly purchased Quick Office side and then changed the name of the company around the key product, around Quick Office. But it's been the same legal entity ever since 2002. Um, and then on the strength of a relationship we have with Nokia, and remember, this is a Dallas-based company. Uh, Nokia's U.S. headquarters was down the street. So through some personal relationships yet again, uh, we were able to cut a deal with Nokia to be the office suite for all their phones. Um, and on the strength of that, we got our first venture financing. Prior to that, I had done it mostly through uh, Angels. We got our first venture financing in the spring of 05 around this whole mobile productivity uh, play that we were going after. And we really, since the spring, of, since basically the beginning of 2005, we executed on that path um, uh, with, I wouldn't call them pivots, we obviously changed our execution strategies frequently, but no you know, like huge pivot in the business from going one path you know, before and now going to a completely different path uh, uh, you know, afterwards. One more question before you continue. Um, <coughs> what were the goals that you were trying to establish with uh, Quick Mobile? And um, what were some of the roadblocks uh, that you came across? Can you hear that? Uh, the goals you were trying to establish with Quick Office? Yes. Yep. And some of the speed bumps that you hit. How did you overcome them? Great question. It's a great, great question. So, um, we wanted to be the worldwide leader in mobile productivity. And we actually achieved that. Um, uh, and remember, it's mobile productivity. So when we started, very, very little productivity happened on a smartphone other than email. You know, many of you, I'm sure, have Blackberries. Um, you know, you're a little younger than I have a 23-year-old daughter. When she was in college, uh, all of her friends had Blackberries. Not for email, for BBM, and now no one. Else. Now they've all gotten rid of them. But the you know back then the, the killer application on a smartphone was email, um, and that was really the productivity thing that people did. Um, and so we wanted to, since you know people were sending their attachments, mostly office attachments, in email, we really wanted to dominate that mobile productivity segment. And you know we ultimately did. You know we were the biggest in the world, shipped on 500 million devices. We did very very well there. Um, we built a great brand, uh, and matter of fact, I mentioned before that we were not preloaded on, we are still not preloaded on Apple, and, um, but the fact that we had built so much brand recognition by being preloaded on 500 million devices, when Apple came along, it helped us immensely because people knew us, you know, because anybody who bought an iPhone came from somewhere else, uh, you know, some other, you know, phone uh, manufacturer. Um, so speed bumps, right? You know, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, you know, that uh, you know, money is oxygen, and without oxygen, you die. Without money, you die. And so, in that period of time, from 2005 to 2007, were kind of lean years for us because it was very difficult to find. Um, to sort of accumulate a revenue base. So our revenue in those two years uh, was about a million dollars a year. I, I told you we sold, we were you know, on uh, a $50 million run rate for 2012. Can you just give me one second? I gotta run and get a power cord or I'm gonna lose you. Yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're 
No, 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 edit. Okay. I should have had you go last. You're a tough act to follow. What? I said I should have had you go last. You're a tough act to follow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. So where was I? Okay. So bumps, bumps in the road. All right. So you've got um, can't run out of money, and so you, you've got to be really you have to be, you have to be really you know kind of quick on your feet. Uh, and so we did you know we did a lot of things to continue to fund the company. You know we picked up a consulting project. Uh, with Nokia that paid us a couple million bucks. Uh, that was really important to us. Um, uh, I ended up cutting a deal with another little company that we bought um, at, in Ottawa uh, that you know uh, probably generated you know four million dollars over three years. Um, uh, and then along the way, also um, we realized that um, you know it's very expensive to develop. Different applications on different platforms, and um, uh, the um, you know so you had to develop it you know once from the for Nokia's Symbian platform and then Android platform and then iOS platform, and we really didn't have enough capital to do that all domestically, and so um, I, I bought a little another little company that had a BlackBerry uh, code base, uh, and, but um, and uh, which would, was going to work for us to build off of for Android, but they had development offices in Russia and Ukraine, and so I was able to get lower, you know, lesser cost development resources uh, because I, I couldn't afford them domestically, and um, so I had a code base to start with and lesser cost development resources. And that made a huge difference, um, and, and you know, then everything was just a function of running hard, and uh, you know, not all things go in a straight line by any stretch of imagination. There's tough things that happen. I we, we used to call it, you know, and and. And frequently they happen on a Friday. Don't tell me why. I used to call it Body Blow Friday, because something bad would happen on a Friday and just kind of you know screw up your weekend. But um, uh, you know, again, you just got to keep plugging away if you're in a you know segment that you believe in, and we did. I have a follow-up question. How did you balance um, work and your personal life? I think a lot of entrepreneurs and young professionals struggle with that. Um, you know, um, it's a great question because uh, I think as an entrepreneur, you tend to define your new normal, and it's really not normal, but you define it as your normal. You become accustomed to doing some crazy things. You know, I had offices at the end. I lived in Connecticut most of the year, but I kept an apartment where we were headquartered in Dallas. So in Austin, Dallas, and Austin, in London, St. Petersburg, Russia, Kharkiv, Ukraine, Pune, India, and Seoul, South Korea. I had customers all over the world. You know, HTC is in Taiwan, Samsung's in Korea, Nokia's in Finland, Motorola was in Chicago and the Bay Area, just as an example. And so, you know, we traveled a great deal. Um, and you know, I've talked to my family a lot about that, and you know I think they saw how energized I was, and you know we felt like um, we made all the acceptable trade-offs and stuff and, and and the like. But you do begin to define that as normal, and in a lot of ways it's not too normal. I agree. Any other questions? Yeah, we'll do one more. Can I ask a follow-up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, what uh, key values and challenges did you have when uh, deciding to uh, you know, a very poor market? Did you hear that? No, Jack. <laughs> yeah. So, what key challenges and things did you consider when you're entering into foreign markets? You're, you have a, a bunch of foreign relations and business students. In, in the classroom, so they're interested about how you decided what foreign market to go into and what variables did you consider when pursuing those options. That's a terrific question. The foreign markets for us were just natural markets. What's interesting is when I got involved in this business, the mobile industry was much stronger internationally uh, in Europe and in Japan than it was in the United States. The United States was a laggard in adoption of mobile. 
um, and only caught up in the last several years with Google and Apple. Um, uh, and so, but when you sell a, you know, when we would preload on a handset manufacturer, you know, Nokia or Samsung or, or HTC or whomever, even Motorola, domestic the only really you know large domestic manufacturer until Apple got in, um, uh, they sell their stuff worldwide. And so we would have to localize our software. We were ultimately localized, I think, in 56 languages, which has development issues about you know there's left, right, up, down language. I mean, there's a lot of things to do uh, in languages, and so. There wasn't less a cultural thing for how we distributed our product because the OEMs distributed the product. Um, where we had more significant cultural issues is that I just mentioned the offices where we did software development. Uh, you know, in effect, across the globe. So um, you know, you'd have you know crazy conference calls at midnight or five in the morning, uh, and you know you had issues where um, uh, you know. Just you know, language challenges and things like that. But one thing I have to tell you that was incredibly gratifying to me was just walking into my office in any office in the world. Candidly, uh, I felt like I was in the United Nations. There were more nationalities. I can remember going to. I can remember going to. Um, uh, you know, I, I visit these offices you know fairly frequently, and I was at a party in our Ukrainian office. And we had about 65 people in this office. They built the entire iOS application. And uh, we went to uh, dinner in a Bavarian, this is in Ukraine. We went to dinner in a Bavarian restaurant where they're passing out steins of beer, about you know, 26 you know, ounces tall. And then all the waiters and waitresses got up there and started doing some Bavarian dance, singing Cotton Eye Joe. And you know, it's like this is the most bizarre blending of, you know, cultures, and 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 but it just works, and you just embrace it. It's you know, it's you know, when I was your age, you didn't think nearly as much about the international nature of business, but 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 you, I lived it. I lived it, and it really is terrific. And now here at Google, it's the exact same thing, and it's wonderful. It really is terrific. I think that's a good transition. Can you talk about what it's been like um, to join Google and um, working with your colleagues as Googlers? A lot of these guys are interested in internships and full-time offers. Okay. 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 Um, you know, Google is an amazing place, particularly for a young person coming in. Um, it is a um, people will talk about. Uh, you, you might have heard the expression of um, being googly. And being googly is something real. I mean, it is just deep seated in the culture around here. And it basically speaks to people who are, if I, if I were to sort of throw out uh, what the people are like here, just consistently, I mean, right down the line, they're wicked smart. Wicked, they hire wicked smart people. Um, they treat them extremely, and these people are generally optimistic, positive uh, folks who have just a real, um, you know, view to innovate and, and, and sort of a desire to really change the world. And, you know, right up through our CEO and founder, Larry Page, I mean, he talks about that every time he talks about they don't want to think of what they do in context of let me be 5% better than the competition. They specifically don't want to do that. They want to think about being 10x, creating something entirely new. And that's for things like Google Glass or self-driving cars or this new, you know, health business they just created and just announced in the last week and a half uh, comes out of. There is a real belief uh, of Google as a change agent in the world. Uh, now, to come on here in an internship or, you know, a full-time employment, it is very, very difficult. Um, uh, and so, um, it, it just, I mean, it, you know, the, the interview process is, um, you know, I just talked to somebody who's going, a friend of mine is going through it, and, and she said that two, she was contacted in two phone interviews, and then is going to have two in-person interviews. It's a gauntlet. It's a gauntlet. You go through a hiring committee, and and I didn't go through that because in the same way because I came through an acquisition, um, but um, it's a gauntlet. It's tough, but it's worth it once you get here. It's worth it once you get here. And it, I'll tell you the last point of this. 
in a big company, and Google's, you know, 40, 50,000 people now worldwide, and 50 offices, something like that. In a big company, you know, you're not going to know everybody, and which is weird for me coming from a small company where I, you know, pretty much knew everybody. Um, but because of how strict the hiring process is, every time you walk into a meeting or, you know, face-to-face -face or in a hangout, whatever, you know that person opposite you is smart, positive, opt uh, optimistic, well-intentioned, et cetera. And it creates a, sort of a culture of, of uh, people being nice. There's a pleasantness here. There really truly is that I haven't seen in other companies. Um, and um, it's refreshing. Other questions? Ambusia? Nope, I'm here. I just didn't unmute. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Speak very loud. Okay. So it seems as if you harness, you know, luck. But how important was the user experience on developing the Because I'm sure that had, you know, a bit to do with how you guys developed and who you developed with. Did you hear the question? No, Jim. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, she commented that you were very lucky. How important was the user experience with Quick Office versus luck? So the um, <laughs> uh, we have some jokesters here. It's no yeah, yeah, we weren't that lucky. We did some things well. Um, the, uh, I'll take luck over hard work, but come on. Um, now the user experience is critical. So it's critical. The, 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 in all seriousness, you earn your luck. Um, you know, good fortune has to come by, but you earn your luck. If our product wasn't good and then enabled us to win each time in a competitive process against other companies to win distribution of Samsung or HTC or Motorola or whomever, Nokia, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, to have software that was architected in such a way that, you know, we could convert Microsoft Office files cleanly into another format and then permit people to edit them and round trip them back. If it wasn't, if it didn't provide a good experience, um, uh, we would not have been successful. Now, the real luck for us came in when this world that we saw, which was smartphones, you know, smartphones were greater and greater number, more and more capable, higher, you know, higher, uh, higher speed processors, uh, you know, bigger, clearer, higher fidelity screens, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, more devices oriented to productivity that, you know, uh, that helped us. We saw that trend clearly. The, a big piece of luck is we did not see iPad coming. And... Um, and that just really helped us big time. But had our software not been, you know, really good to, you know, again, on iPad, you know, we were the, you know, we won the world in iPad in a big way, then, um, you know, iPad helped us grow a much bigger revenue base. Um, uh, big companies were, um, continue to buy iPads like crazy as a PC replacements or as a, as a you know, an, an extra device. Um, and they needed an office suite on their iPads, and that was us. So all of a sudden, it opened up a whole new sales channel for us selling directly to enterprise. You know, in the past, we had sold through the handset manufacturers, frequently referred to as OEMs, Original Equipment Manufacturers. We sold through the direct-to-consumer stores, so iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, et cetera. And then ultimately, we opened a third channel, which was direct to the enterprise. Um, and so you needed to be good in order, you know, good quality software that, you know, provided a good utility and a good value. You needed to do those things well, such that when, when iPad came around, uh, that's the luck piece. When iPad came around, you had to realize it and do something about it. And so what we were smart about is we realized it. I mean, I came back, um, I remember I came back from Mobile World Congress, which was, was held every year in Spain. And all of a sudden, I'm like, everybody's coming up to us as an enterprise company. And we're not an enterprise. We don't sell enterprises directly, but I could see it coming like a freight train. And I, you know, I threw so many resources at it, um, and which proved to be a, a successful move. Um, and you know, it's interesting. Back in the day, 
um, we started where we really were you know, had our first real strength was in Symbian. Before Android and before iOS, Nokia's Symbian platform controlled 80% of the world's smartphone market. We had a competitor who had the embedded relationship with uh, BlackBerry. Um, we pretty much abandoned Symbian and went all hands up into Android and iOS. Our competitor, believing that there was no better platform than BlackBerry, because you know business users, the ones who held you know mostly used Blackberries back several years ago before BBM, and that who better to be on, than to be on BlackBerry, stuck to their knitting big time on BlackBerry. They came later to iOS and Android, but much later. Um, it crushed them because obviously we know what's happened to BlackBerry. It's sort of you know going away in a huge hurry. Um, while our decision to go cross-platform to iOS and Android, which was expensive, um, was uh, in hindsight the right the right call. Plus, we were lucky. <laughs> well, I know we are way over time, but I just wanted to say thank you for okay. everything. I don't know if you have any last words of wisdom. I know you guys have lots of questions. We'll send an email with questions. Okay. Well, listen up. You know, um, being an entrepreneur can be very rewarding. I warn entrepreneurs all the time. I say, if you have a great idea, I don't want to end on a bummer, but I'm going to tell you this anyways. If you have a great idea, and you work really hard, and you do everything you think is right, chances are it'll fail. That's a bad thing to say. Entrepreneurship is hard. You're subjected to a lot of risks that you really can't control. You know, technology changes so swiftly. Consumer tastes change so swiftly. And that can hit you, you know, like a two-by-four against the head, and you just can't do much about it. So there is an element of luck in it. Even if you do everything right, odds are still stacked against you. So you got to have passion for it. Do it because of that passion more than anything else. Um, and if one fails, and I've done three startups, and one was a very exp personally expensive failure. Uh, the um, you know you just gotta sort of accept the volatility and keep plugging away and keep plugging away and enjoy it. It's a crazy life, but enjoy it. But listen, I, I enjoy speaking to everyone and send me questions and uh, love to do it again sometime. Hi, Jen. I'll see you in New York. You're coming for Google for Entrepreneurs Week with Chris. Yeah, I'll be there on Monday. Yeah, I'll be I'll there. See you. See ya. Thanks. Sure, bye. Bye. -bye.